and welcome to Bloomberg Quint uh, with a few days now to uh, look through budget documents, budget numbers and try and understand the thrust of the budget. Uh, we perhaps have a slightly clearer idea of what the budget can and cannot do for the Indian economy. Uh, joining us to talk about that is Prachi Mishra, Chief India Economist at Goldman Sachs. Uh, she's here with us in the studio. Prachi, thanks so much. Lovely to have you here. My pleasure. Uh, let me just start with uh, you know the big picture on the numbers. I think this time around the focus was uh, sharper than ever. Uh, so uh, what is your sense of how realistic the budget has proven to be, uh, both on FY20 numbers and then FY21? Um, so, Ira, let's uh, go over it slowly. Yeah. Um, I think we can start with FY20. As you know, uh, the headline uh, budgeted uh, fiscal deficit number was 3.3% uh, of GDP, and um, the RE estimate for FY20 is 3.8% of GDP. So, basically, a slippage of 0.5 percentage points of GDP which I think markets had already positioned. So that's why you didn't see, you know, in fact, uh, bond markets rallied a little bit uh, this morning. The important point to note is that if you look at total shortfall in receipts, that's actually as high as 1.6% um, of GDP. And um, so that has been offset in the budget, same as was done last year. If you remember, you know, we, we talked last year about the last budget exactly the same three things why um, you know the, 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 the there have been savings on three things which which implies that the actual difference in um, headline fiscal deficit is smaller than the short shortfall in receipts number one um, you know higher non-tax revenues about I think 32 32 thousand crores or, or of that order uh, number two lower transfers to states and that's actually a big number about I think uh, 1.6 lakh crores and, um, um, and, and number three, cut in spending, which is basically current spending and food subsidies. Okay. So that's why a bottom line, FY20, the numbers, the slippage in fiscal deficit is actually much smaller than the shortfall in receipts, uh, which, which, which you saw. Um, on FY21, let me, come to, um, let me come to it. I think there, clearly, I think the policymakers have tried uh, to you know, have a balance between macroeconomic stability and growth. Mm. On the one hand, you know, the economy has been slowing. So therefore, they've tried, I mean, they wanted to give um, a fiscal stimulus to boost growth. But at the same time, there's not much fiscal space to operate on. You know, if you look at India's consolidated fiscal deficit, it's highest across emerging, among the highest across emerging economies. And, um, you know, Moody's recently sounded an alarm bell on uh, India's fiscal and debt position. Um, so what it appears, you know, that they've tried to take a calculated risk. Mm. And how have they taken a calculated risk? They've adopted a path of fiscal consolidation, i.e. FY21 headline fiscal deficit is projected to decline uh, from 3.8% of GDP to 3.5% of GDP. And at the same time, they have actually a pretty ambitious um, you know, spending program. 13% increase yep. in spending with a nominal GDP growth of 10%, which is high, and 18% increase um, in capital spending. Mm. So how have they actually met this, you know, how have they done this delicate, you know, balancing act? I think if you ask me, there's one linchpin of the entire uh, framework, which is higher privatization Open receipts. Like yeah, that. yeah. And I think, um, so, so FY21, um, it's 0.9% of GDP, up from 0.6% of GDP, which is the estimate for FY20. Um, FY20, actually, originally, they had budgeted for 0.5% of GDP, and they ended up in 0.3% of GDP. And now there's a big jump in FY21. I think what markets would look forward in the next few weeks is you know, more credible plan and a more credible program for this privatization, more details, concrete time, like, yeah, and, and that will bring a lot of confidence, I think, and credibility to this budget. Okay. I'll get back to the numbers, you know, but Raji, last time you'd explain very nicely to me uh, uh, as to whether the fiscal impulse based on the budget is positive or not. So for FY20 and for FY21, is there support to the economy is the broad right. question right. I'm right. asking you right. if right. I'm getting my terminology yeah. wrong. I think this is exactly, Ira, this is the right question to ask. What macroeconom as macroeconomists, we think about is there a fiscal impulse in the budget is there consolidation is there expansion so how do we get um, to this number it's pretty simple we look at center but we also look at states and we look at public sector enterprises let me be clear that we do have information on central public sector enterprises yeah. in the budget but we actually don't have any information about the state public sector enterprises so my assessment would be limited you know to to the, to, 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 to the central public sector enterprises so fy20 our calculations basically suggest a consolidated deficit 
of 8.8 percent .8 of GDP. This so is central fiscal deficit plus central plus CPSCs. state, yeah, central plus state plus, state plus, plus state. central CPSCs. Okay. So there is an impulse of 0 0.8 percentage points in the FY20 budget. So okay. this actually, um, uh, you know, th 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 there is a substantial fiscal impulse which should be supportive of the economy going forward. This is FY20. FY20, because okay. you know, there's also a lag in terms of you know, you give you give a fiscal stimulus, it takes some time to impact on the economy. So for 2021, I think 2020 and 2021, what, what is more relevant is actually the fiscal stimulus in FI20. Okay. But let me tell you on FI21 as well. See, FI21, we don't know about the states because state budgets are not out as yet. Public sector enterprises, I think, you know, if you look at the budget document, it's saying about one point, I think 2.2% of GDP for FI21 public sector enterprises down from 2.4% of GDP. However, you know, actually for FI20, I mean, uh, the original budgeted was 1.5 percent of GDP, mm. and it's up to 1.4, 2.4 of GDP. So it's, I mean, it's, it's it, the decline to 2.2 in the FI21 budget for central public sector enterprises is not that credible. Okay. So let me restrict to only the se the center. Huh. And there, I think there is an important point to make, which is, um, you know, as I said, FI21 budget rests entirely. I mean, I mean, uh, the framework rests a lot on the privatization program program for which there's a big boost. Okay. Standard international practices IMF government finance statistics you you treat asset sales as below the line mm -hmm. because it's a financing item and it does not contribute towards yes. uh, the fiscal deficit so actually if you strip out that there's, there's a fiscal impulse in FY21 as well so okay. th there's so, so so you basically what you do you add the 0.3 percent percent of GDP which is the asset sales in FY20 to your headline fiscal deficit okay. your fiscal deficit is higher by like you know three point uh, 3.8 plus 0.3 4.1 mm. and that goes to 4.4 or 4.5 in FI21. So you have net of asset sales. You actually, even if you restrict only to the center, you still have a fiscal impulse of 0.3 to 0.4 percentage point of GDP. So this, although the headline numbers are suggesting, you know, fiscal consolidation, etc., it it's actually, uh, you know, a fairly large uh, fiscal impulse in the budget, whether you look at FI20 or FI21. FI21 will become clearer, I think, once state budgets come out and when the next budget come out, come out and we actually know about how much public sector enterprises have spent. Okay. Uh, what is uh, happening on the state transfer side? I noticed that you point out that state transfers are lower right. than you would have expected right. them to be. And right. Um, so uh, on state transfers, I have to say that, as I said, FI20 budget, RE and BE, 0.5 percentage point slippage, uh, uh, despite a shortfall in receipts which are much higher, 1.5, 1.6 percent of GDP. How have they met it? Three ways, and one of them is actually lower devolution to states. So state, I think, uh, state transfers are down by like. Uh, around 1.6 lakh crores in RE versus BE. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a fairly large number. Typically, you know, one thing, uh, you, if you look at the transfers as a proportion of gross uh, tax revenues, in typical years, it's 33% or low, which mm. is true in you know FI19 as well as you know FI20 BE or FI21. Uh, even FI FI18 is but it was actually higher. FI20 RE is actually you know 30%. Mm. So definitely, it's going you know, in terms of if we go beyond the numbers, it will definitely definitely have implications um, you know for the states as well. I think once it starts filtering filtering down to the states. But this wouldn't include the compensation cess part, right? right. That would. Uh, right. be separately accounted for right. separately see compensation assess uh, in the budget is actually it it, uh, it, 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 it it is a line item in both the revenue and the spending spending part okay. so that is actually balanced in the budget this okay. is there's a separate line item for transfers to the states okay okay understood a couple of things now into next year and you know not just the numbers but uh, they have increased capital spending but it's you know, 18 percent yes but it's on a low base right so I mean uh, it's not like there'll be a huge kicker on capital spending unless some of the off-budget things like uh, you know they've given 22,000 odd crore to that NIF and right. they can leverage it and then continue spending I mean is there going to be significant government spending support to the economy is broadly my question look I think 18 percent um, growth in capital spending is when you have a nominal GDP growth of 10 percent is okay. fairly large okay. I, would, I mean just on a macroeconomic basis um, you know what are the details of that when when I talk to for example our infrastructure specialists um, you know, they, he still he believes that uh, there is actually an infrastructure push um, in the budget, uh, so that is a plus. Um, and clearly, if you look at you know some of the other you know components of the infrastructure budget, like you know PM uh, Gram Sarak Yojana and some of the others, I think there's okay. there's a big boost. So infra is a boost, um, but I think you have raised a broader point. 
capital spending in the budget mm. is generally, you know, is 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 is, is paltry. You know, it's yeah. one point six, one point seven percent of GDP. We had talked about it last year as yeah. well. That broad picture does not, not change. change. <laughs> and if you look at overall, say public investment, actually a quarter of it is done by the budget, central budget. I think. 40% or so by the states and rest by the public sector enterprises. So that big picture is not changing, you know, with, the, with this budget coming out. Okay. There was some, uh, you know, sort of talk about food subsidies coming down, but they haven't actually come down. All they've done is that they've transferred it uh, into the borrowings and uh, pool of NSSF. So the food subsidy number shows lower, but it's not like it's actually right. lower, right? right. Um, I think food subsidies are definitely, so this is typical. I think even in the last budget, you, you know, you have to meet a certain fiscal deficit target. Where do you cut? Mm -hmm. and Food subsidies is typically where you cut. And um, the thing is, even next year, it's at 0.5% of GDP. This year, you know, FI20 RE is 0.5% of GDP. And even FI21 is 0.5% of GDP. So clearly, I think they are not moving the deferred payments to next year, or it's being carried over forward and moved to other forms of financing, which you're seeing. Okay. Was there any, uh, you know, two areas of concern in the economy? One was consumption, uh, and the other was rural, uh, you know, the rural economy. On consumption, a little bit of a sentiment booster, I guess, with this, you know, optional personal income tax, maybe uh, rural schemes, uh, some increase, uh, but, you know, perhaps doesn't go to the root of the problem or could not have gone to the root of the problem. So, so clearly, I think you asked two questions. One, income tax cut, and more on the rural budget. So rural budget is up this year. Yeah. It's about, you know, I think 13% um, uh, uh, or so. If you look at um, the two main schemes, I think PM Kisan and uh, the Manrega, I think overall there's a 9% increase on them. So, uh, so clearly, again, our rural specialist is saying there's some boost to rural spending in the budget, not like huge. I think that's what I think our assessment is on the rural budget. On income tax, I would say, I think income tax cuts, again, a couple of things. Number one, um, I mean, clearly, I think 5 to 15 lakh uh, bracket, there will be some boost uh, to spending. I think um, at, at, at number two is on compliance, mm -hmm. right? I mean, compliance, if you are, you can use these income tax cuts provided you're not taking into account, um, uh, you know, of exemptions, et cetera. Um, it depends, we, you know, corporate tax cut, for example, you know, a lot of, it's, it's not clear how companies act, whether companies actually used, they were, act, they were better off in the old system than moving to the new system. Income tax cut also, I think, even though you know there should be an impact, it might take some time to filter out. And in fact, if you look at the budget numbers, um, FY21 versus FY20, so despite the cut, you actually, the revenues, income tax revenues are increasing by about 14%. Mm. So clearly, I think the budget is incorporating the fact that, um, you know, the impact on, even though I think the, the, the loss in revenue is about 40,000 crores, which was the number stated in the budget, the increase in compliance would be higher so that you, you have actually a reasonable growth in um, income tax revenues. Okay. But I want to move to the financing side. Uh, so. Uh, I think the bond markets today are thrilled that there's no additional borrowing coming in. Uh, well, fine, you know, good relief for them in the short term. But the way the financing profile is changing, where you're borrowing a significant amount from the National Small Savings Fund, I'm not sure how you see that uh, if this remains a long-term trend. So, Ira, you're absolutely right. I'm looking at the numbers. I think FI20 BE to RE, it's uh, almost doubling of, um, you know, and if you, if, particularly if you compare FI19 actual and FI20 RE, it's uh, doubling of, um, you know, uh, the funds coming out of the small savings schemes. Um, I think from a market perspective, it's a good news. You know, that's why probably, I mean, markets care about net market borrowing. And I think uh, I think the net market borrowing number has not gone up significantly because a lot has been moved to um, off budget, uh, you know, off, uh, or, you know, small savings, not, you know, off non-market forms of no. borrowing. Um, markets, of course, are, are happy with that, I think, but this has implications. For example, on the one hand, you know, you're trying to increase a monetary transmission. Yeah. Uh, banks are saying that, look, we cannot cut, um, you know, lending rates because uh, we our deposit rates uh, deposits are at a historical lows uh, you know we, we we cannot cut deposit rates because we are losing customers to small saving schemes yeah. and to um, you know some of the other for example equity mutual funds etc um, this problem is actually going to be even because they'll have to keep rates relatively high to uh, you know uh, garner so much of uh, funds through the small saving schemes so it's so in a sense that will make it, 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 the job of the central bank even more challenging
to enhance monetary transmission, which, which itself is you know, fairly complicated in an emerging economy like India. And I'll come to monetary policy in a minute, but isn't there, is there a broader theme? Uh, you know, for the last few budgets, you've seen an attempt to draw in more and more f uh, foreign savings, whether it's via the ECB route, the FDI route. This time around, there's a proposal to open up limits uh, on you know, FPI participation in corporate bonds and perhaps in some categories of government bonds. Uh, th that's the bigger theme, right? I mean, our domestic savings pool is just proving to be inadequate more and more. Okay. Um, I think it's a good point. You know, savings data came out on yeah. Friday. Yeah. Um, and if you look, you know, so let's look at the overall balance sheet of the economy, which includes uh, the public sector and corporates and households. Um, if you look, you know, uh, if you look closely at the numbers, the overall surplus for economy for the economy as a whole has actually now turned into negative. So for 2019, the latest numbers which we have is actually minus 0.9% of GDP, down from like 2.5, 2.6% of GDP. That so is the? This is the financial surplus of the economy as a whole. Okay. So this is the balance sheet of the economy, okay. which is income minus spending, or you can think about it as saving, savings minus investment. Hmm. So this is com the minus 0.5 number is composed of two parts. One is the public sector, and the other is the private sector. The private hmm. sector is composed of households and corporates. Yeah. Um, so what you have is an exact mirror image. So, so, so private sector actually is in a reasonable amount of surplus. Mm -hmm. It's 5.2 percent of GDP and the public sector is a, is a guzzler. So, so, so it's exactly negative and minus 5.7 percent of GDP. So if you mm -hmm. add these two it's minus 0.5 percent of GDP. So I think oh, to the extent that you know your investment cycle is muted I think you can you can still still yeah. live with it. Once the investment cycle starts picking up Either you need, you know, domestic savings to increase, but actually domestic savings, if you look at the data, um, financial savings actually declined in the, in, in the latest data quite sharply. Yeah. So, so, so I think you have to think about, you know, how, do, in, in fact, physical savings went up. Yes, and, noticed, yeah. and, you know, uh, financial savings, net financial savings, because gross savings, I think they, they use net financial savings to compute gross savings for some reason. But I think net financial savings actually came down sharply in this uh, latest da data print. So to the extent that the investment cycle is muted, it's fine. Once the investment cycle uh, starts to pick up, you know, something, either you get you know, the funds from outside or you, you, you try to increase savings. Increasing savings is not, you know, uh, an immediate, uh, you know, you can't do that immediately. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I think some of the measures in the budget, for example, you know, in, uh, relaxing some of the limits on corporate bonds, allowing NRIs to invest in certain kind of government securities, they all, I think, <laughs> um, welcome move in trying to solve this, you know, big balance sheet problem for the economy as a whole. But potentially creates another problem, right? So the impossible trinity which all of you speak about, or is it too soon to worry about that? See, I wouldn't worry about the impossible trinity at this point because, see, standard international economics impossible trinity is more about the external sector. It's about, you know, you cannot have, um, you know, a fixed exchange rate, uh, free capital mobility, and, um, you know, and, independent and exogenous uh, mor uh, in, uh, independent monetary policy. Um, I wouldn't worry because I don't think we are in a, you know, regime of you know, perfect capital mobility. Uh, or you know a completely fixed exchange rate so I wouldn't worry about uh, the external okay. sector uh, Trinity at this point but the but the but the fiscal problem in terms of you know balance sheet of the economy that I think is a more first order problem okay allows me to just ask you a couple of questions about monetary policy as well so this week uh, we'll see uh, you know another uh, review coming around but what's the bigger picture for monetary policy did we get done with most of the potential easing last year and this year will be largely status quo maybe 125 basis <laughs> point cut here there so our uh, forecast is uh, that you know the central bank would be on hold, and uh, let me say you know, give you three reasons. Um, I think one, inflation has been inching up. We do think that it's going to be temporary and should come back for the year as a whole. Still, you know, fairly muted. We should give a couple of more prints, you know, given the uncertainty about food, food inflation, etc., to form to have my view more formed up. Um, but I think the fact is that inflation has been inching up. I think 7.4 was the last reading. It's running at 7.5, mid, mid sevens uh, yeah. now. Um, and so, so inflation inching up. I think growth clearly, I think, um, uh, you know, RBI should have comfort from you know the series of measures which have been announced uh, over the period of the year and some in the budget as well. And you know, the fact that there are you know, green shoots showing up in the economy. The purchasing ma managers indices just yeah, came out like yeah. uh, good and, job. And, and, yeah, and the P PMI manufacturing has jumped up. Our GS India current activity indicator also is around five mid fives now. Okay. It used to be like fours in, in the fours a couple of uh, months ago. It's a combination of high frequency indicators, and we use it you know at high frequency to monitor the economy. Um, so I think 
all in all, I think um, the central bank should have comfort uh, in terms of growth, uh, in terms of growth numbers. And third, I think the signals from the RBI has al have also been pointing in that direction. If you look, the RBI governor recently gave a speech yeah. where he talked that look, um, I think um, uh, monetary policy has has uh, yeah has has I, I think or you know uh, interest rates have come down like by 135 basis points. I think fiscal policy and structural reforms also have to uh, you know complement this. So overall, I think. Um, I, I would think due to all these fact all these three factors inflation inching up maybe a little bit more comfort on growth and you know the role of other policies to complement I think uh, it seems uh, a status quo would be more likely they might change the stance from being accommodative to a neutral really? because, uh, that'll shock the market uh, I'm not sure if it's, it'll it'll shock the market because generally I think uh, rates have been going up right mm -hmm. and rates have been going up uh, in the swap markets because um, you know with inflation going up and again some companies Comfort on growth as well, um, uh, so, so I think it just opens, um, you know, it, it's open. It, it opens the possibility of, um, you know, if just in case, you know, if, if, if the uncertainty around inflation gets more uh, magnified, it gives you a window where you can, you know, operate uh, the other way. I do think the bar for raising rates is very high at this point relative to another cut, as you point out, pointed out. But, you know, away from the interest rate part, uh, the RBI has sort of gone into a little bit of uh, murky territory on two fronts. Liquidity is still very, very high, you know, surplus of two, three lakh crore. Uh, we had done a story the other day on, you know, certain private borrowers now borrowing below repo. Mm -hmm. um, plus, of course, they gone into this yield management thing uh, with this operation twist uh, is there a little bit of confusion uh, for the want of a more technical word on what monetary policy is doing I think it's um, you know the liquidity stance I think is more that they have to be supportive of growth so there has, there has to be sufficient liquidity so that growth 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 goes on I think there is no confusion on you know what they are doing I think it's clearly an inflation targeting regime uh, they are targeting inflation as you know keeping in mind growth objectives um, so I think I mean operation twist of course you know the, the, the slope of the yield curve has increased sharply in India and uh, maybe the operation twist um, was one attempt to address that through other measures but I don't think there is any uh, this is just an additional toolkit in RBI's uh, you know, overall central bank uh, monetary management toolkit. I wouldn't, uh, at least, I don't see confusion in markets okay. on what monetary policy is is targeted uh, at. Okay, I'm not going to make too much of this, but there is this escape clause debate doing the rounds as to whether that opens the door for the RBI to come in and buy in the primary markets. We don't know it'll happen, right. but you would, in any case, caution against it. If so, you know, I, would, I have to say that I'm a bit surprised about the FRBM escape clause because. Uh, uh, the, the escape clause, I think the magnitude of the deviation is about 0.5% of GDP in the escape clause. But the trigger was like fairly st stringent. Mm. It basically said that, you know, the average growth over the last four quarters have, has to be at least three percentage points below um, the last reading. I think we are still, the last time I checked the numbers, we are still like 1.7 percentage point below the average of the last four quarters. So number one, uh, I'm a bit puzzled about tr whether this escape clause can indeed be triggered and in terms of you know um, you know RBI directly buying bonds um, on the government probably it would not be appropriate for me to uh, you know comment on that I think it's uh, I don't see the rationale for it I think the market mechanism is still working very well so um, you know perhaps I'm missing something there all right last question then Prachi uh, where does this leave us for uh, the year ahead in terms of uh, the growth inflation sort of miss and the uh, mix and the risks you uh, see uh, in FY21 um, Asir I think our overall view is that um, 2019 and 2018 were uh, was a difficult year for India were difficult years for India and typically financial market participants ask us three things you know when did the slowdown start how big is it and why did it happen I think where did the slowdown start if, it, if you look at our GS India current activity indicator this episode of slowdown started January 2018 how big is it about two more than two percentage point higher than the early 2018 pace why did it happen again financial market participants are focused on NBFC and NBFC we think it's a combination of both global and domestic factors um, our global current activity indicator also started declining uh, from you know early 2018 and within domestic factors I think there have been a number of things a sharp decline in consumer confidence a negative central government fiscal impulse in addition to you know definitely funding issues which aggravated the slowdown 
going forward, I think we are slightly more optimistic, I think, for 2020 and 2021. And I say this because of four, five reasons, and I also highlight what the risk, risks are. I think globally, I think the economy should be better. Of course, there have been some downside risks with coronavirus, etc. But I think, by and large, uh, our view is that a published forecast suggests that global economy should be better in 2020 and 2021. Domestic financial conditions, if you look at a you know, simple weighted average of short-term interest rates, long-term interest rates, uh, equity prices, and trade-weighted exchange rate, that's eased by about 100 basis points. We talked about fiscal impulse. I think there's a significant fiscal impulse already in the system. And I think number four, um, you know, there have been a series of measures which have been taken uh, by the government. I think they, sh they should feed into sentiment and also some easing of infra bottlenecks. And finally, fifth, I would say, you know, there are some early signs of economic stabilization in the data. So all, all of this combined, we do see, you know, 2020 and 2021 to be better for the Indian economy than the last uh, few years. When the turnaround will start and what the magnitude would be, I think we can debate to death. But what's but your number five. for FI21 right now? So we are, we, are, we, are, we are 1%. So see, FI20 is going to be closer to 5. Hmm. For FI21, we are 1 percentage point or more above the FI20 number. Okay. I should highlight that the, there's, the, the big risk to our numbers for FI21 is the domestic financial sector. I think okay. domestic financial sector, still a lot of risk aversion in the domestic financial sectors. NBFCs have slowed dramatically from 24% yeah. to like 3-4%. Mm -hmm. I would say three reasons. One, I think clearly there's an economic slowdown, less people are asking for loans. Number two, I think regulatory restrictions, Basel kind of restrictions. And number three also that, you know, which I think is the biggest r downside risk uh, to my growth forecast is basically that there's a lot of risk aversion in the system. Mm -hmm. I think um, the economic survey also pointed out that instead of actually going and lending out to the economy, NBFCs are shoring up on government securities. Mm -hmm. I think this has not been broken broken as, as yet. And that is the bi biggest challenge, if you ask me, in addition to global risk and fiscal risk, which we talked about um, in terms of our outlook going forward. All right, Prachi, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak to us and explain how you see the economy. Thanks so much for watching Bloomberg Quint. City Union Bank introduces...